Welcome back to the Psychedelic Podcast by Third Wave. Today, I am speaking with Dr. B.J. Miller. So the research around psilocybin on folks who were dealing with end-of-life anxieties, whether they were on their deathbed or upstream of it, was trying to see its effect on that knot that gripped them and got them stuck. And you know, one psychedelic experience with psilocybin guided with some attention to set and setting, careful uh, observation and integration. One experience uh, loosened that knot for just about everybody involved. Hey, listeners, I'm so excited to have Dr. BJ Miller on the podcast today. BJ is a physician, author, and speaker, and has been practicing hospice and palliative medicine uh, for many years, and is best known for his 2015 TED Talk, What Really Matters at the End of Life. BJ has been a thought leader in the space of death and palliative care and hospice for many years now. And in particular, he was influenced in this process by his own accident that happened when he was in college, which we'll talk about on the podcast. And so we we go into sort of a, a range of topics. We talk a lot about death. We talk a lot about regrets at the end of life. We talk a lot about what it means to actually live a very meaningful and fulfilling life. And then we go into the role that psychedelics can play in helping to manage and clear fear as it relates to transitions and the end of life. BJ is very humble, very kind, and it really was an honor to be able to speak with him for today's podcast conversation. So without further ado, let's go ahead and let's get into this episode with Dr. BJ Miller. Hey listeners, welcome back to the Psychedelic Podcast. Today we have Dr. BJ Miller, who will be joining us for an episode on death, dying, palliative care, and the role that psychedelics can play in that in that process. Dr. Uh, Miller, it's it's really a pleasure and an honor to have you here. Thank you, Paul. It's nice to be here. And please call me BJ. I'll call you BJ. All right, I like that. Mm -hmm. All right. So, as I mentioned before, we we started the podcast. We've been we've been recording episodes for the last six years, and and we haven't done one on on death. And dying, and and as many of our listeners are aware of, there's a lot of exciting research at the intersection of psilocybin, in particular, for end of life anxiety. And um, mm. as context for this, the the ancient Greeks used to have a phrase uh, that was basically, you know, to die before you die means you won't die when you die. And this was part mm-hmm. of, this was inscripted in the temples that they used to have the Eleusinian mysteries. In. And so um, I'm really excited to dive in today and talk about how, how can psychedelics help us prepare for death? Why is it that our mm-hmm. culture is so afraid of death? Like how do we treat death? Uh, but before we get into those topics, you know, the, the first place that I often like to start is, is, is your story. And just, you know, to, to be, to be one of the most prominent, if not one, if not the most prominent, sort of thought leader on on death and dying, um, in in the landscape, I'm just curious, what what brought you to this? You know, why why focus on death and dying? Why has it become really the the center point of uh, not only your professional career, but also I sense a, a, something that's deeply personally meaningful for for you as well? Yeah, Paul. Yeah, thank you, buddy. Um, it's, it's interesting the. Death and dying for me, it's not, it wasn't the initial hit for me that pulled me into medicine and into palliative medicine. Um, but it, it is sort of, it's evolved that way. But I still don't even think of it. I mean, I still think of my, I'm interested in death and dying because it happens, <laughs> you know, because I, I'm, I'm really, I'm trying to get, right with reality and as long as reality seems to include death and dying that's my interest you know i'm interested in loving life as fully as i possibly can and therefore including as much as i can and therefore i'm interested in death and dying so 
I think that's an important qualifier. Uh, and for my own arc, you know, I was uh, I got injured in college, electrical burns, pretty bad, and uh, came close to death myself. Um, but at the time, it wasn't. You know, that was a profound experience for me in all sorts of ways. But the early years as I was recovering from that experience, my mind went to uh, dis- issues around disability and, and how we suffer in all sorts of unnecessary ways. You know, we treat disability, we treat death, we treat disability, though, early thinking was, you know, why do we, why do we isolate people who are no longer, whose body doesn't quite fit the normal silhouette or, you know, whatever it is, why, why do we alienate ourselves from illness and disability and eventually death when these things just happen? So, you know, as a disabled person, you're not, you not only deal with the, fallout of those changes in your own life but you also have this feeling that you enter this like you have to leave the world of the able-bodied and the independent people and you've got to go over here to this sort of consolation prize a second place world of dependency and even all the language disabled like i you know when like who gets to who gets to be the standard person against which we all measure ourselves? Who is this guy? <laughs> and, and so, when forced to kind of reckon with a different body and a different life than I had anticipated or had known, I became really aware, and I had been aware of this thanks to my mother who had polio. I've been around disability my whole life, so this wasn't new stuff, and it became very personal. And I was there so i was just anyway i was very interested in looking at how we why we're so cruel to ourselves and to each other why we hold ourselves against standards that are impossible um why do we end up hurting ourselves and each other more than we have to so that was my way in to medicine so i went into healthcare to medicine to kind of work in that zone to you know if i had if my doctor had walked into the room looking like I'd look, I think it would have made a meaningful difference to me at that time. I was trying to mm. find myself. So anyway, that was the impulse. I went into healthcare. Um, and it was really late that I stumbled onto palliative care. Hadn't I had heard of it, but I, I didn't I didn't and it hadn't given it much thought. I thought I was gonna do rehab medicine, work with other people who had just gone through some sort of traumatic illness or experience. So anyway, long story short is I got I did a, a rotation, an elective rotation in palliative care at the Medical College of Wisconsin where I was doing my internship and fell in love with the field immediately because you know, palliative care simply for your listeners, you know, it's often conflated with end of life care, hospice, etc. But really important to understand that palliative care is a much larger umbrella. It's not just about dying. It's It's really the focus of palliative care is helping people not suffer any more than they need to and helping people realize themselves in the world and realize the joy in the world. So it's about mitigating suffering and maximizing quality of life. Um, And that big umbrella sweeps into its fold end-of-life care and hospice because these are things that people by necessity have to eventually deal with. So that was my way into death and dying, end of lifey stuff. Was that was the context that push pulled me in t- towards the end of life? Which, when I started working at UCSF as a junior faculty person, and I was continuing to weigh, continuing to ponder my own experience, I came to see myself of having little deaths. You know that there was a death of my identity when I became injured. There's death of my limbs. And then you start cracking open around that and you start seeing death all over the place, literal and metaphorical. And then I started to realize how much it did for me to go through that process, much like your intro around the ancient Greeks. I experienced that sensation, that feeling that, wow, I'm so glad to have died before I die because it really sets you up to live very fully, very richly. and to not kick anything out of your experience. 
And so I, that was happening for me personally. And meanwhile, I'm meeting a lot of patients who are at the end of life because palliative care finds itself in the mix at the end of life for many people. So it was all kind of coming together. But it was, and, and then I went to work at a place called Zen Hospice Project for several years. And that's where I really started focusing in on this particular issue, question, dying, how we die, et cetera. But again, only because it was this concentrated, very precious zone where time was really short, where these ideas, these issues, these feelings were no longer abstract. Death was really in the room, you know, and that reality then sculpted, has sculpted the rest of my career. And so I keep finding myself talking about death and dying, but what I really, what I really think I'm talking about is, is life and living. And it speaks to the sort of dualistic nature of existence, right? That when, Mm -hmm. when we're able to, whether it's through psychedelics or whether it's through a near death experience or whether it's even through things like breath work, um, Mm -hmm. uh, vision quests, uh, there's so many modalities to, you know, uh, fasting, right? That mm-hmm. that experience then, right? That experience of, of 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 death, so to say, creates this sort of voluptuous um, mm-hmm. um, awakening of oh, there's there's so much beauty to be grateful mm-hmm. for in life, right? And there, there there's so much richness and connection and and love and and understanding. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I love that word, Paul voluptuous. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Cause they're, you know, from uh, culturally, it feels like death is very much a taboo. And that that was sort of the the next question that I wanted to to open up for you. I, I read a book many years ago about taboos and I forget the exact name of the the book title, but it was something about how we as a, a, a Western society fear death and that, that fear of death, um, is is dictates so much of our neuroticism and so much of our suffering, even. Mm. And so, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about wh- why is it that that death, in particular in Western culture, is 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 such a taboo and and sort of mm. off limits. Why is it that we stick old people in nursing homes and and refuse to visit them? Why is it that hospitals are so are are so industrial and 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 not really comfortable places to die? Just mm. yeah, bring us into that a little bit. Yeah, it's a big question. I mean, I think there are a lot of answers to it, or a lot of layers to it. Um, I mean, one is I like to remind myself and others, like because there's a because there is a critique. What I'm, the rest of the things I'm about to say about it, there, there there's a criticism in here, um, and but like a lot of like like many or most or all things, like you know, these impulses come from somewhere. We're not just you know. So I think it's actually very useful to just work with what we have, including this fear, including this repulsion, and see what's in there. So one is to say, you know, from medical training, you learn very quickly that, you know, we're wired, we have a, we have a, a reflexive, and there's nothing to do with our thoughts, a reflexive, we will run, we will fight or run away from anything that's threatening our existence. Fight or flight. And that's at the, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That is... That's your uh, it's your wiring. It's not your choice, you know. Uh, so let's start there. So that that's okay. Fair enough. It's not you know we're not just all in denial. In other words, we have this drive to avoid dying. Okay, so fair enough. Um, now the problem is, you know, or not a problem, or well, maybe a problem, maybe an opportunity is that's like a, that's in the acute moment where you know the epidemiologists. You know, natural historians, biologists will tell you, like, yeah, it's great if you have a saber toothed tiger and walks in your room. You need that kind of energy mobilized real fast. Truth is, most of us don't hang around with saber toothed tigers anymore. And, you know, so it's gotten really kind of um, all these boundaries between acute and chronic, you know sort of real quote unquote real fears or actual physiologic fears in a moment versus sort of in the fears of our mind and our imagination is all kind of vaguely differentiated. So the fact is one of the riddles of being a human being, and it does feel like a riddle to me, Paul, I, you know, it's, it, and you look at the roots of, you know, a lot of religious, you know, sort of, 
whole religions look at the origins of origins of judeo christianity we ate from the tree of knowledge right we we took the apple not the tree of life we ate from the tree of knowledge so we humans were cursed like a punishment we had to be we had to have the burden of knowing things maybe chief among them is we had to know that we die in advance of our death mm. and mm. And that can feel like a curse. So, and so now we're bringing religion into it. We got a whole religion that calls this a punishment for original sin, right? So that, dang it, I got to know that I die before I die. Um, and religion can be helpful in some ways and hurtful in some ways, of course, right? So, I don't see it as a punishment anymore. It just is what it is. So I got to know I die. Well, how can I make that? How can I work with that? Uh, where's the opportunity in that? If that's just a fact of being a human being or being a conscious crit critter, well, where's the opportunity in there? I think we do we humans get really creative when when we learn to want the things we need, you know, whether like I think about this with food, like you could say, Oh, poor humans, we gotta eat stuff to survive. We gotta go find food, or poor humans, we need shelter to weather to deal with weather or clothing or whatever. But Humans turn those into opportunities. Like now we get to like architecture, you know, fashion, cuisine, all these things. We've turned, we've made these needs our own by leaning into them and working with them and playing with them. It's so beautiful. And so if we need to die, well, where's the version? What can we do there? Like, you know, how can we play with that? How can we work with that? And one of the things that I and many, many, many people experience is, well, it's not that I want to die, but because I have to, you can let that, like you say, bring you in this voluptuous experience with life because it is so precious, because it doesn't last. That's not a problem, really. That's, that's what lights it on fire. That's what gives it this sort of, mm, this power. So... I'm getting a little far afield from your question. I'm kind of heading towards the no, opportunity, is, but to back up, this is yeah. Good. Well, so, so, well, so to back up a little bit and back to why we, so we've named biology, we've named religion. There's two big reasons why death is this, ooh, this problem. It's a problem, you know? Uh, so let, sticking with the problem for a moment. And I think, you know, I think it's very helpful to see our flight from death as a piece of the flight from nature. For whatever reason, especially in the West, we decided that it was man versus nature. As though man, human, is not nature. And look at the fallout of that one. <laughs> That's all over the place. That, we are living in a I hope, in a sense, a, a reckoning of the short-sightedness of that, of that false separation. We have pulled ourselves out of nature uh, to conquer it and all this stuff. Ooh, so that, I think, is a big answer to your question of how the hell do we get here? So we have been at war with nature in all sorts of ways, death being one of them. And because we've been, in some ways, especially in the 20th century, pretty successful with that death. But again, you've already brought in ancient Greeks. This is not just a modern phenomenon. But, you know, um, we have just gotten more and more. You can avoid big truths for a long time. You can live in a – I live here in an apartment, brick apartment building where I keep, you know, all sorts of nature is kept at bay here. Um, and in some ways to my great convenience and luxury. But ultimately, there's a cost for it. Um, so, so this sort of this attitude towards nature has spilled into our attitude towards death and caught, made it a problem. Healthcare, medical world, this invented model that is profoundly powerful and saved my life. Um, that model took upon itself took it upon itself to demonize or pathologize. All sorts of normal events. Who, who, who's never gotten sick? In, you know, in the medical model, that's path. That's pathology. There's something wrong with you. Okay, again, as a convention, fine. Let's call it a problem. Fine. Then we differentiate 
normal from pathological. And it's a convention and it, can, it, has, it has its utility, but it also has its fallout. So the medical model has driven us farther and farther away from the truth of nature. And, you know, the medical model is, you know, got a problem, call it pathology and go to war with it. And if we just think hard enough and study hard enough, we'll beat it. So that has certainly played into this spastic distancing from death. And then on top of the, all that, so what we've got biology, religion, we've got uh, modern medicine uh, and the medical model and our invent our inventions, including this sort of man versus nature, our own. Uh, and you could take that back to Descartes, perhaps this dual dualism that you mentioned, this duality uh, that we have falsely separated ourselves from reality. Uh, you, those are huge pieces of the puzzle. And I think, lastly, probably is. Is on the level of cultural and social, and which is beautiful, wonderful, vague social science of sorts. How culture moves, how society moves, how our thinkings and our metaphors shift. You know, a lot of our experience flows from those constructs, and so somewhere along the way, we've kind of inherited superstitions. Like if I say I die, then I'm gonna die. If only I, if I don't say it, it won't happen. You know stuff like that um so put all that together and probably some other things i'm not thinking of right now and that gives us i think that tells you why we're where where why we are where we are and I, and i'm i'm taking lots of notes so you'll probably at times i write things down and and there's a few you know one phrase i wrote down is death death is not a bug to be fixed. And and I think there's a there's a propensity in particularly Silicon Valley, however we want to currently define Silicon Valley post-COVID, mm-hmm. kind of these technocrats of mm-hmm. how can I live forever? You know, and mm-hmm. and how can how and, and of course this has been going on for thousands of years. We've been looking for the fountain of youth and you know longevity mm-hmm. and how we live forever. And yet the the truth of it is progress positive change, the evolution of consciousness only happens through death. Because as mm-hmm. generations die, uh, the sons and the grandsons and the great grandsons uh, can take the mantle and shift and change, right? Like there's there, there, there's a mm-hmm. lot of shadow, I think, to mm-hmm. to this avoidance of death. Um, and then right. on the, the, the man versus nature part, we had Jeremy Narby on the podcast mm. about a year ago or so, Jeremy wrote a book called The Cosmic Serpent, where he talks about how mm. with the Shipibo, when they work with ayahuasca, uh, baked into their language is a clear understanding of how connected they are to the forest and to you mm. know the, the world around them and how in English, in our very language, it's baked in that, that, that sense of separation. So it's almost like from birth, we are born into a cultural system that teaches us on every level to fear nature, to fear death, to fear the unknown, I would say to fear the feminine and the dark and, and sort of mm-hmm. what that what that is, um, mm-hmm. which then becomes amplified through the the current medical model and becomes amplified through mm-hmm. our, our attachment to ater- materialism and and you know all mm-hmm. these all these other things. Yeah. Yeah, and and by the way, on that note, sorry if I'm interrupting you, Paul, but that, that no, 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 we no. are. This is part of the sort of irony, or whatever the right word is, that we are victims of our success. I mean, the technological revolution is profound. It is amazing. Um, problem is, of course, are we invent things that are so powerful that they use us versus we? Like, if we could just keep the order right. Like we use the technology. It doesn't use like you know. Let's get clear about that. So anyway, so we are victims of our success. It is absolutely seductive nowadays to think that you could make death sort of optional. That feels almost within reach, thanks to our successes in these various models playing themselves out. Language is a huge one. We do this all the time in medicine. We call death a failure and blah, 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 blah. So anyway, just to highlight what you're saying there. But can I also mention one other thing that you said when you you were talking about fear? I also, I think it's important to, that we don't accidentally ostracize maybe anything, including fear. Like fear is natural. Fear happens. 
I don't believe people who say that they're never afraid. And this, the distinction here is, I think what you're pointing to is we have come to hate fear versus welcome it, work with it as just like anything else that's part of our raw material in this life, in this raw emotional material in this life. So uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with fear. Fear makes a lot of sense to me. Hating fear and trying to stamp it out of your life is where I think the trouble comes. And so there's discernment there. There, there, there. There's, there's clear from a physiological perspective, right? There's a reason we have an amygdala. There's a reason that we yeah. have the fight or flight mm-hmm. or response. It's, it's helped us to survive and thrive for thousands and thousands of years. And yet, as you, as you mentioned mm-hmm. before, the saber tooth tiger example, there, there, there is this sort of constant neurotic fear that seems to envelop everything. Um, mm-hmm. That's driven by scarcity. That's driven by a uh, lack of worthiness. That's driven by, I think, a lack of connection. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I think, and 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 this is, I think, a good transition point for psychedelics to some degree, um, mm-hmm. because psychedelics are one of the tools then that they can help to dampen that fear response. They can help to dissolve the construct of the individual ego to see beyond uh, sort of our our narrow viewpoint. And I'd love, kind of, as we as we open this up a little bit more, just to hear, like, when did psychedelics come into your awareness? You know, was it was it through mm-hmm. the research? Was it through, you know, other means? At what point did you realize psychedelics could are phenomenal tools for that palliative care, for suffering, for death and dying, mm. um, for life mm. and exploring life? Well, I guess I've long been interested in uh, altered states, you know, so sometimes in a constructive way, sometimes in a destructive way. You know, earlier in life, I loved my booze i love my weed I, you know i still do frankly but just <laughs> let's be careful with this stuff in moderation but, you know right in moderation. in moderation including moderation um so yeah so i think for me my own my own art has been of just an interest in altered states and if i got past the taboos of it the mores of it i think my body knew something it was also doing something interesting, whatever else, whatever short sightedness I was demonstrating. I think I was also, there's something, the, the kernel of, of something good in there was really about, you know, triangulating, sort of shifting my perspective, because it helps me understand that my perspective is not the same thing as the truth. It is how I experience truth, but my perspective is changeable is malleable and so by triangulating with these altered moments altered states or moments in some altered state help me triangulate my own perspective and therefore help me play with it and help me not confuse it with the truth so that's what i that's the the best part of what i've ever been up to with pursuing any altered conscious state so but psychedelics specifically uh it was on the list of things i would have played with back in the day um in the form of mushrooms or lsd but not a ton not a lot Mm -hmm. Uh, there was a summer i had when i was uh i guess it was this was the summer before my injuries actually somewhere between freshman and sophomore year of college i was at chinese language summer school in indiana and a buddy of mine, Mario, <laughs> of all places, uh, he and I, yeah, <laughs> and he and I spent a lot of time playing with LSD and mushrooms. It was mm-hmm. wonderful experience. But that, that was that was pretty darn recreational. We would <laughs> take this this stuff and go watch. We watched Gremlins two in the movie theater at the mall <laughs> like thirty times that summer. <laughs> I literally was, was David <laughs> Bowie in that one as well. I know he was in the original. <laughs> Grubbins, was he? But oh, I, I think, I think so hard to keep track. David Bowie's phenomenal. Yeah, talk about yeah, psychedelic. what a man. <laughs> what a man. Um, so anyway, so I played with it in this way, but I didn't really know what I was doing. It wasn't conscious, you know. But I'd also, again, I did, it was not destructive either, not intended to be. Um, so back to your question. It's really, like a lot of us, it's sort of the resurgence. It's in my role as a physician working with people trying to help them get right with themselves before they die that psychedelics kept coming back into the mix one way or another the conversation increasingly through the work of folks like tony bosses and others 
Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Richards, I mean, a wonderful man, holy cow. Um, yeah. So I, just like a lot of us, as, 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 as the doors opened up again to return to research, that portal opened up and I started to see it in a much bigger context, much more historical, potent, uh, ancient context than, uh, that, like so many of us, I got more and more interested in, in this stuff. And that initial research, I mean, I think, I think it was Michael Pollan's article, The Trip Treatment, which he published in The New Yorker in 2015, where he had interviewed Tony, he had interviewed a number of cancer survivors. He had, he had sort of asked them questions about what they had experienced. And, and one thing I picked out as well, which is, goes back to your point about palliative care, I don't, although it was framed as end of life, there were more than a few people in these research trials who went on to live for many, 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 many years after that, that psilocybin experience mm. as well. Um, now, and if, if you need to punt on this question, you're more than welcome to, since, since I know this isn't necessarily your specialty, but just for our listeners, can you tell us a little bit about kind of the research around psilocybin for end-of-life anxiety in terms of why it is an effective tool to help with suffering and palliative care and Mm -hmm. And and maybe within that, you know, I was I was watching you have a phenomenal TED talk, which I would recommend that all of the all of the listeners go check out after this. Mm -hmm. It's from I believe twenty sixteen uh, or twenty fifteen, mm -hmm. and you talk about the role of design in death mm -hmm. and aesthetic. And so I'd love to also mm -hmm. hear your thoughts on you know so much we talk about set and setting with psychedelics. Mm -hmm. So and I often think about the Aldous Huxley story where. Eldis injected himself with 100 micrograms of LSD on his deathbed uh, to sort of go mm -hmm. into the white light. So I'd love just to hear kind of a little bit about the research and then your thoughts on designing spaces and, mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe the role that psychedelics can play in, in palliative care and hospice care as, we, mm -hmm. as they become legal, as they become medicalized, as they become more available for people who are, who are suffering uh, with, with end of life. Yeah. Yeah. So... And thank you for the caveat. I am not a scholar um, on anything, really, including psychedelics. But and actually, you know, it's funny you mentioned that article by Michael, Michael Pollan. It may be if I had to pinpoint a moment where I my eyes got sort of reopened to this vast potential. Michael Pollan, I met him when I was at Zen Hospice Project. Which was probably, and I think he was he came to interview me uh, around that article. I think I don't know if I made it into his article, but oh, I look. think I owe him the. Yeah, I don't think I meant. I don't think I don't think my. I don't think I said anything worth printing at the time. <laughs> but I think, I think I I need to credit him coming to see us at Zen Hospice Project because the, the question, of course, was: Do you guys here who are dealing with death all the time? You know, do you see a need or a place for psychedelics? And so I, it may have been that conversation with him, which would have been around 2014, maybe 2013, 2014, uh, something like that. Okay. So just to give him his due, um, that turned my eye, to tune me in again. Uh, so, but back to your question, I think, uh, so my read on the literature, again, not as a scholar, not in great detail, but the gist is, and what I see all the time in my own practice is, whether someone is dying in a week or in a decade, when they are given a diagnosis of an illness that will someday take their life, you know, an advanced cancer, you know, people can live with for years with cancer. Um, but when that abstract thing, yeah, yeah, everyone dies, we all die. Okay, fine. Yeah, get bit by a bus today. Sure, fine. It's not, it's not even a useful. I wish it were useful or a refrain because there's some real truth into that, you know, but it's such, it's just such, that's like white noise. We can't even really hear it. It's just too abstract. But when you get a diagnosis um, and all of a sudden you have a sense of the, the specificity of your finitude, um, it can really undo a person. Um, and back to the sort of mind excuse my language or mind fuckery of knowing we die before we die, that thought can cease to be compelling or, or useful. It can be a trap. You can just uh, perseverate on it and, and it can shut you down. 
And I see that not uncommonly, especially when I was at UCSF at the cancer center there. People who had these diagnoses who now are introduced to the thing that was like a time bomb and then someday going to take their life. And that sent them into this vigilant state, this gripped state. Um, and so, so the research around psilocybin on folks who were dealing with end of life anxieties, whether they were on their deathbed or upstream of it, um, was trying to see its effect on that knot that gripped them and stuck, got them stuck. And the the you know one psychedelic experience with psilocybin guided with some attention to set and setting, with careful uh, observation and integration. One experience uh, loosened that knot for just about everybody involved. And if there were any untoward side effects or folks who went the other way, um, I, I don't think there were. I don't think there was sort of like zero bad stuff and lots of good stuff. Um, I'm a, and I want to be cavalier here. I think you could hurt yourself with, with psychedelics. I think you could hurt yourself with a pencil. You could hurt yourself with just about anything. So I don't want to be cavalier. But the data within this careful context practically zero downside and this huge upside of what I, you know i've been as a physician my in my repertoire to deal with people who were knotted up around their own death and was sucking the life out of them before they died you know like they were in a bat in a not helpful way they were dying before they had to die because they were so stuck i could talk to them i could try to normalize their experience I could give them Valium to ease their nervous system. I could distract them with opiates. But that was about it. It's not the same thing as undoing that knot. But here in these research studies, consistently, folks who met this description were having these transformative experiences. And these experiences lasted beyond whatever, however many hours the chemical was in their bloodstream. It lasted for months, maybe years, that it shifted their own relationship to their to death. It shifted their own sense of being gripped by fear around it. It helped them not, you know, you, you maybe we can know we're con everything's connected. We're all connected, but it's one thing to intellectualize that, but to feel that connection, to know it in your bones. Um, to not need a word for it. You just know. To feel that connection is a powerful, beautiful thing. So what the what people were reporting was that their fear of death went away. It's not like they stopped believing they were going to die or they still knew that death was around the corner. But it, it, lost its, it lost its concrete potency. It was now much more porous. Like, sure, I'm going to die. This body's going to die. My ego is going to die. My sense of self is going to die. But my body is part of this thing that's ever going. Ever, it, Life and death are always swirling around each other, completely entwined. And people absorbed that truth in this one experience. Just amazing. You know, just stunning. And again, the alternatives, it's not like we had something that worked nearly as well. We did not. We do not. So that data was just, you, you had to sit up and take notice. And so that's, anyway, that's the answer question of my read well, on the, the research. And, it, yeah. and it's a beautiful summary, you know, like that, that experience of gnosis, right? Mm -hmm. Like divine knowing, divine connection. Um, it, it's interesting, um, Plato after going through these Eleusinian mysteries, was able to talk about substance duality, which through his own psychedelic experience, he realized that the soul and the body are actually separate forms, and that while the body dies, the soul is eternal. Uh, it's it's mm -hmm. transcendent. It's it's it it is connected to let's say the ground of all being, source, mm -hmm. something greater and unknown. And mm -hmm. I mean, this is. I was around the same age when I first started doing LSD and, and mushrooms as you were. And I remember the experience was so profound because I had been raised in a um, relatively religious home being in West Michigan and, you know, Protestant and, and all that. Mm -hmm. And it never really clicked growing up. And yet 
as soon as I had that first LSD experience, all of a sudden I was like, I get it. Like I get what yeah. these philosophers and what these mystics and what all these people are talking about. And so I think when we talk about untying that knot, um, there is so much anxiety around like yeah. I am going to die. And it's, as you said, it's, it's, um, the anxiety of dying is actually creates a lot more suffering than the dying itself to some exactly. degree. And, and so yep. that, that a capacity to untie the knot then allows for a much, uh, allows for an ease of suffering in people's last, you know, years, months, weeks, and days, which is such a gift um, mm. when it's so clear that the end is the end is coming. The end of the physical form is coming. Mm-hmm. Right on. So, kind of on the, the the piggybacking of that, you know one one thing that you had talked about in this TED talk, and we've sort of touched briefly on, but I, I would love to have a, a kind of a go a little bit more concretely into this is. Mm-hmm. You, you you had this beautiful um, turn of phrase where you compared anesthetic to aesthetic, mm-hmm. and that the anesthetic is you know obviously it's something that knocks us out, whereas aesthetic is something that really brings us to life. So I'd love to hear sort of your thoughts, your perspectives, even the work that you've done and been a part of is when we're looking at those last months, those last weeks, those last days. What is a set and setting that really supports? that death, that dying, that, that, that sort of process of easing suffering as people are going into that white light, mm. if you will. Yeah. You know, one way into this is, I mean, I, I, I came to even hear the word and think about aesthetics through the art world. Um, but through conversation with a dear friend of mine, Justin Burke, who is a philosopher and he wrote his PhD on Hegel and on aesthetics. And he taught me so much. And so we would have these conversations about aesthetics. I, me, I was just interested in art. And I was interested in vaguely kind of like, what does a body do? Like, why, why, you know, why, why am I interested in having a body? You know, it, it is a source of pain. It's the thing that dies. I don't know. Um, and as I came very close to death, I, I became very clear. I loved having a body, a body because it f- feels things. I come to see my body as basically a sack of sensors, the way to interface with the world as a, way, as a medium through which I experience life. And, and then this sort of extra layer. So, that, so we would kind of intellectually talk about how cool aesthetics were or something like that, and, you know, but it took a while for me to see this sort of therapeutic nature of it, um, which is essentially, mm. you know, like a couple things. Like one is if I think about, you know, where and what I missed when I was a patient in the hospital and what I love now, like a couple things that always come up for me, riding a bicycle or a motorcycle and feeling the sort of gyroscope you know, on two wheels and the ballet uh, moving through space and just not as transportation or as exercise, but just for its own sake to, as, a, as a sensation or playing with the animals that I live with. You know, I realized that those things just, that's all I wanted to do. I, I craved those things. Uh, and they were sort of simple things. You know, and I, so all of a sudden these things that were useless took on huge meaning, you know, purpose. I don't know what purpose to rolling around with a dog on the floor is or riding a bike outside of transportation, et cetera. Like it was its own purpose. It was a reason enough for living. It was a reason enough to be glad I had a body and reason enough to be sad I would lose my body someday. So I started to feel this poignancy in sensation in the felt universe. This, and as I kind of hypercharge, I kind of tried to hypercharge my intellect as a younger person, mm-hmm. thinking that was the way. But as I was having these realizations about aesthetics, I was realizing it didn't have anything to do with thought. Like you don't have to have a thought to have a feeling. 
And I've been further honed by watching a lot of patients I work with just be terrified of dementia, of cognitive decline. And I don't, I'm terrified of it. That doesn't sound great to me either. But I am increasingly aware that there's a world beyond our thoughts, that our thoughts and is not, aren't the, isn't quite the same thing as reality or thoughts about reality. Um, so I got really interested that a, here's this thing that's accessible. As long as you have a body, you have access to feeling something. It, it doesn't need a story of purpose. It doesn't need a big narrative. It just feels in the moment, feels right or good or something. It's its own value. It's not a means to an end. It's not this thing we do to ourselves as serve. We leverage our present moment for some possible future state, whether I withhold things from myself now so I can get more later, I can study really hard now and I'll become something down the road. All these things, we, we hijack ourselves a little bit. We hold ourselves a little bit hostage. And these, everything We see everything in strategic terms as a means to an end. But where do the means and ends collide? Where, is the, where are the means and the ends one and the same? That's the aesthetic world. It, again, a feeling doesn't have to have a purpose. Doesn't, there's no story required, no intellect required, and guess what? No time required. So as I started working with patients who, for whom time was this really precious, and oh shit, I've I had, now I'm aware I'm dying. I've got a couple months to live. How am I going to weave together a life of purpose now? That may be out of reach. Uh, and some people say, well, that's it. Get me off the planet now. A lot of my time is coaching people to say, no, 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 hang in there. Just isn't being enough, isn't being enough. Not just being, if I can be more productive or this utilitarian stuff. So so all these things kind of came together and I'm like, holy shit, we're sitting on something really beautiful, profound, accessible, you know, and requires no time, no thought. And as long as we have a body, great. And bodies, by the way, are the things I'm so sad to lose when death comes around. So just all these roads converged and kept pointing me to this aesthetic domain. And I'm so, so grateful for that. It has really helped me loosen my own knots around my own ideas of being of use in the world or whatever else, or having a, writing a story for my life that is really has a nice beginning, middle, and end, and all that stuff. That's great. Purpose is great. But my point here is I've learned it's not essential. You know, there's, there's stuff beyond stories of purpose. I think being is enough. And I can tell you from working with people who are beyond their own sense of purpose, their identity has melted away. They don't know why they're on the planet anymore. They can't answer the why questions anymore. But if I can get them to enjoy just a, a sensation, they're good. It's a way to hold people until they actually die. And that's, that's been profound. I just love that stuff. It's, it's beauty, right? That, that, that capacity mm. to be, to be, um, moved, to be, to be in mm. awe. Right. Is, yeah. As long as you define beauty as something bigger than pretty, you know, beauty is sometimes terrifying. You know, it's, it's beauty is, I think maybe it was Justin taught me, Hegel said something about, it's like beauty is, is, is truth embodied, essentially. So anything truly itself, whether it's a turd or a Mona Lisa or whatever it is, like there's that, that is beautiful. So depending how you define beauty, yes, it's about beauty. Well, well, there's, and I, I think a misconception of aesthetic is that it's superficial. Right. And exactly. So, Exactly. When we when we talk about aesthetic, when we talk about beauty, inherently there is there is a depth that encapsulates both the the sort of inspiring and the terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Huxley would talk about heaven and hell, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, we have both awesome and we have awful, mm -hmm. and and they're both awe. Awe is central mm -hmm. to those, but they're kind of two sides of the same coin in some ways. Exactly. Excuse me. Um, right on. And one of the following on what you're just saying there, I think this is our conventions really hurt us sometimes. I think we, we tend to think, uh, uh, you know, 
wonder and terror as opposites, um, you know, awful and awesome as opposites, you know, opposed, life and death, opposed. The truth is, those are right next to each other. Beauty and terror, all, all that stuff is right. Those are millimeters away if, there, if there's any separation between them at all. And that, that bring closing that circle that we undid and tried to force into a line, reacquainting that those ends into the circle that they are is something that psychedelics can do, something that beauty does. Um, and it seems to me that's very much the point. And because you do that, then you've connected life and death. Then you're not at odds with reality. Then you can be sad, but you're okay being sad. There's an acceptance of what is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Even a delighting in it. Even a rolling around with it. And I got clear on that when I was in the hospital. Like I had horrible pain that I can barely remember. But there were moments where I was just so glad to feel anything, including pain. Mm. And that that's great. I I'm really so that if you let if you follow these threads, if you let these things blow you open, well then what can fall away from your experience is all these conditions. I'll like myself if I X, Y, or Z. I'll like life if I blah blah if it does this or that. No, drop those drop those conditions. If you can, if you can honestly get to a place where those conditions lose their potency, then you're really then you're really okay. Because then you can love life without condition. And and many would say this is sort of the pinnacle of development, or this is the pinnacle of uh, experiential, or this is this is enlightenment, mm-hmm. or this is you know. There's a lot of different ways that we've attempted to describe it. Where it's precisely what you're saying. It's that it's that experience of being um, that often can't even be encapsulated by words. It is it is simply a feeling, mm-hmm. and it, and it's a feeling of beauty of transcendence of awe of inspiration of love of terror of sadness of grief of anger um it is it is a, it encapsulates a totality and that totality all of life. the above and nothing is left out of that equation the strength of any system i can ever could ever imagine i wonder if this is a law written somewhere the strength of any model the strength of any system is judged by how little is left out of it so as you're just describing, nothing's left out of that equation. Nothing's isolated. You're not at odds with anything. So yeah, amen. Give me that. Amen. Last, we're 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 nearing the end. We we still have ten minutes left. 10, 15 minutes left, and and mm-hmm. and so there's there's a couple a couple questions that that I'd like to ask you uh, that relate to regrets. That that's the first one in terms mm-hmm. of you know there's a over the past few years, I've seen, I don't know if it's a meme or an article, like these are the top five regrets of, of those who are, who are dying. And I'd love just to hear kind of your lens and your perspective on, on regret. And, and as someone who has spent a lot of time with people who are nearing death, what, what are some of those, you know, what are some of the most salient regrets that people have as, as they're, they're nearing the end of their, their life and their existence? Yeah, so regret, that's a big one. I you know, it's a juicy subject. I have I've come to see regret as like a fear of the past, in a sense. You know, something like that. And some harsh relationship to what's already something that's already happened or didn't happen. But somehow it's linked to the past. And when you're at the end of life, there's not much future, sense of future. Uh then you're, you know, your your whole life is past, <laughs> and so those regrets get really poignant if you have this, if that's your relationship with the past, because that's in a sense all you have left. And so regrets is part of this condensing and concentrating experience that happens towards the end of life. You can really get loud um, and really stand out. So couple thoughts i mean one is just like we're saying but every time i try to like you know find something wrong that i want to change in the equation whether it's a patient's death like if we could just get his pain down or if only that person didn't have regrets well like we said at the beginning of our conversation paul like start with 
whatever your feeling is all right fear whatever just start there just start there so if and I, I think an honest i of course i have regrets if i take regrets to mean things i wish i had done differently mm-hmm. of course i do like fear of course i have fear but i think the idea here is not and what i see practically speaking with folks in their life is not to somehow convince them that they don't have regrets or they're not afraid or there's no need for fear, no need for regret. It's more like say, Oh yeah, those are no, that normal, natural, normal. So what you really, if I, the, the one thing I, 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 so far, if I'm trying to change anything versus find a way to be okay with everything, I'm trying to change the shame that comes with some of these states, mm-hmm. shame to be afraid of the shame to be regretful. But by my own metric, I should probably find a reason, a way to embrace shame too. Um, but but back to the, this point about regret. So you know, it's friggin' normal. It's just uh, yeah, okay. But it also forces you to realize if you let it, if you follow through, like again, that's the past. You can't you can't go back. You know, if we somehow figure out a way to go back. I wonder if I would take that. I wonder how interested I'd be in it. But I'm glad that we can't go back because we're innocent. In a way, we're innocent before our past. It's in the past. You know, would I do it different? Sure. Maybe. So there, it's another knot that comes up a lot that if you go into it with people, you can open it up and there's a lot of stuff hanging out in there. Um, and there's a lot of resolution that can happen by opening that up and talking out and letting people exorcise that regret in a sense. Mm. And that can help soften it a little bit. So it's something like, like everything, something to work with. It's the vagary of us humans having this weird mind that can go backward and forward in time. Um, the the curse of say, sentient intelligence that we were chatting yeah, about before. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, part of part of that curse. Yeah. So yeah, and I think so. A couple more thoughts. I mean, one is you ask about what kind of regrets come up. Uh, well, first I want to say something before I forget. Regret. It, I have. I see a lot of people struck by regret as they near the end of life. But I also see when folks are really, and it's not the someday, but like the day of, or you know, really close, where they've had to let go of so many of their constructs and their their thoughts, just the dead end cul de sacs of their mind, just had to just they fall away by force. And I think we can choose to let go of these some, some of these things. But when you're really, really at the end, some of these things by force have just been, in a sense just driven out of you you've had to you've had to yield again submit again and again you're on your knees you just let go of it. because it's going you have to let go of it there's not much of a choice um so oftentimes regret fears a lot of these things you realize those are stuff those are loops of a neurotic of a mind who's that's a living, an issue for living people, <laughs> an issue for people who have still some sense of time in front of them. So a lot of the stuff will magically just melt away in the hours and moments before we die if we let them. You know, we, people around them might keep those stories of regret alive or fear alive. We, living people, may project them onto the person who's closer to death. But really, if you let it, that stuff will melt away. So I want to say that because... I think a lot of our fears around death have to do with these scary things that once you're actually dying, become immaterial. So let that be a let that be a relief. But still, for those of us who have some indefinite time span in front of us, we still we should work with these things. So now, now finally to your question, what kind of regrets come up? Um, well, there's these sort of classic things like no one ever regrets not spending another day in the office. Or, something like that you know in other words don't work so hard you know or something like that well i've actually never heard anyone say that and you know really uh really i think the regret and i don't and i've also never heard anyone say what i'm about to say to me per se but as i translate what i'm seeing and what i see you know 
the, the big one is that they acted they didn't they didn't they acted from fear not from love they and again i'm not trying to say again we all have fear but it's when you act from that if that becomes your sculpting tool in life you will talk yourself out of trying things you know so if we all if death is a failure fine let's just work with that definitely if we're all going to fail in other words then in a way no harm in trying if I succeed, I fail. If I fail, I fail. Okay, whatever. <laughs> like, you know, great. Take some of the sting out of it. Like, let, let death do that. But th- so that's what happens when someone doesn't let death into their conscious into their conscious consciousness and their conscience existence the existence of their conscience. They, well, I'm sorry, I don't mean to conflate consciousness and conscience two very different things. But yeah. that is the idea of. You know, isolating yourself from parts of yourself, uh, not having a holistic view of your own self in the world and of life in the world that includes fear, death, regret, other things, then you become prisoner of those things. And so back to this question, I'm finally getting an answer is, is the big one that I see one way or another, never really articulate this way, is that they regret that they didn't love more or that they acted instead of that they acted from fear more than love. If you, folks who have chosen love and early enough in life to experience how painful and harsh love can be too, and that you had some other thing you have to take. It's not just a pleasant feeling. But those of us who have chosen to love less because it'll hurt less, you know, once you've made pace, peace with pain as part of the deal, well, then you're not fleeing pain. So you're not avoiding pain and you're not making decisions out of some sense of safety that will keep pain at bay. You will act from love. It's a more of an abandoned state. And those folks have a lot less to regret at the end of life in my experience. So I don't know. Did I finally answer your question, Paul? I think it, it's a beautiful cherry on the the the, the, the death Sunday that we, we had a chance to, <laughs> to explore today. Because it also, it, it goes just to bring this back to, because the podcast is somewhat psychedelic focused. It's so cliche, of course, right? That, that Mm -hmm. love is all there is as the Beatles would say. And yet one of the biggest lessons in teaching from working with psychedelics for both myself and I know many, 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 many others is that love is everything and that the capacity to love ourselves, to love uh, our family, to love our community, to love the earth and, and nature, it creates this expansive, mm-hmm. it, it creates expansion. Um, it creates the, the capacity to live in a more voluptuous way. And, mm-hmm. um, and, and fear while you while is is necessary it kind of has this contraction component Mm -hmm. and and i think my sense is a lot of people kind of on the same level they regret not really listening to their intuition not really listening to Mm -hmm. what it is that they knew their purpose or their mission was um whether that's conditioning or whether that's how they were raised or whether that's culture whatever Mm -hmm. it is and love mm-hmm. transcends all of that, and the experience mm-hmm. of love transcends all of that. And it's, it is the most important, I think, emotion or experience is love because it can heal so much, so much. Amen. And I would say back to, and remember, let's make sure to not fall into the, uh, the more. Uh, you know, cliche piece of it. It's like like we're saying about beauty. Beauty is not like pretty. It's not necessarily pleasant. Love is not like oh, tra la la, easy easy peasy. I just love everything. You know, uh, no no. <laughs> the big love, real love, is is all encompassing. Love is about the least conditioned state we can imagine. I'll I'll love you, Paul, if you do this for me. Is that love anymore? I don't know. I don't. I don't really think so. So the love you and I are talking about here. I what doesn't it include? And therefore that's why it's so powerful. It doesn't kick anything out of its view. It doesn't need to it doesn't it takes it all in. It is the most efficient 
circulator of life out there because it leaves nothing out. Big love, true love. And that's the love I think you and I are talking about. A, a word I wrote down is devotion, right? That that mm-hmm. love that's unconditional. There's a devotion to a partner or a child or a, a business or a mission in the world. And that devotion, whether it's incredibly fun or whether it sucks sometimes, mm-hmm. that decision, that choice to continue to show up and be devoted is I think where a lot of is that, that, that to me sort of encapsulates love and, Mm -hmm. and what it means. Beautiful. Well, final sort of concluding question to, to cap all of this and, and somewhat of a more personal question for you, um, is, you know, on the topic of life and living, you've, you've had, an illustrious career of in in many ways of 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 uh, in the palliative care space as a medical doctor. You've written a book. You've had a TED talk. You've um, done some in, in incredible thought leadership and and just caring for 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 humans. And I'm just curious what what are you excited about? What is it that you're working on? What is it that is sort of really bringing you alive, creating vitality in your existence? You know, we're recording this December first, 2022. Like you know, 2023 is around the corner. What are you jazzed about? What are you really looking forward to? What What's there for you, BJ? Well, one answer to that question, that wonderful, generous question, is I, I more opportunity to realize what you and I have been trying to find words for. You know, still more time to 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 actually realize what we're talking about here and to feel everything we're talking about here. So that's one answer to your question. More specifically is I love what I'm up to work-wise is a couple years ago, my, my business partner, Sonia Dolan, and I started what we call Metal Health, Metal, hmm. M-E-T-T-L-E, Metal, like one's inner strength, one's inner reserve. And we love this little company of ours, and we have been tinkering with it for two years now. Not, you know, wanted to kind of get it right before we try to announce it much to the world. But I think we're about at a point where the we're ready to kind of hit the gas on developing this thing. And we pulled it outside of the medical model. And it allows for us who work within this model to be much more expansive to not be so partitioned as personal or professional to find this interplay between all the things we're talking about in a sense, a, 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 con- a constructed thing and an invention, a vehicle for us to try to realize what we've been talking about. So that is so building metal health is what I'm really, really excited about. And that's, what's going to get all my attention uh, here coming up and, and, and making it, not just building mental health as a successful company, whatever that means, but actually success would be, does it do what you and I have been laying down today? And I think it has a chance to do so. And mentalhealth.com is, are there, is there some information there then people can kind of check, check out what it's about? Yeah, you got it. And we have a little, I guess we're on Instagram at metal underscore health. I think it is, but yeah. Yeah. And if folks want to learn more about your work, the title remind us of the title of your TED talk that was. Oh well, then, that's funny. I I named it not whether but how. Um, TED apparatus changed it to <laughs> what matters, what really matters at the end of life, or something like that. What matters okay. at the end of life, or what really matters at the end of life. Okay. Um, but that's 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 what it's officially titled. And then your book remind us of your book name that you wrote in. Uh, that one, uh, my co-author was Shoshana Berger, and we wrote that it's called A Beginner's Guide to the End. Oh. There's a subtitle, Practical Advice for Living Life and Facing Death or something like that. But the title is A Beginner's Guide to the End. It is, it is we touch on the things we're talking about today, yeah. but it's much more of a practical guidebook to kind of move you through the paces of healthcare, advanced planning, all that stuff. So, yeah. Well, we'll link to that as well. BJ, I, pre- I appreciate you spending time on this Thursday afternoon and and talking about mm. the 
the range of everything it, it, to to have this conversation about death is and, and and to be with someone like you who has spent so much you spent so much of your vitality and energy exploring this and being with this and and honoring this and and so i'm just i'm just so grateful that you, for your willingness to to sh- to share a little piece of you and uh, your perspective mm-hmm. and your wisdom with with us in the podcast today no, it's a pleasure. I'm so glad you're having these conversations and putting them out in the world. This is this is where it's at as far as I'm concerned. And I really appreciate you taking the time too. Today is the anniversary of my sister's death. It's a big day for me over in my family. So I'm extra glad to be talking with you about it. And uh, yeah, I love you, Paul. It's been a pleasure. Nice to meet you. And I love you. I love you too, PJ. This has been so fun. <laughs> this has been so fun. Thanks so much for watching. If you want to stay up to date on the third wave of psychedelics, subscribe to this channel and visit the thethirdwave.co where you'll find plenty of free resources on intentional and responsible psychedelic use.